This is J. Paul Mitchell interviewing for the study of economic development in Muncie and Delaware County for the Center for Middletown Studies. With me today is Larry W. Campbell and I'll let him introduce himself. Yes, this is Larry W. Campbell. I was the uh, manager of design methods at Westinghouse Electric and ABB Power Transformer Division in Muncie. I uh, started there in drafting and the uh, manager of drafting and then proceeded to uh, the manager of design methods for the Power Transformer Division. Uh, we later merged with ABB and also uh, bought out the uh, GE uh, core form transformer business and I was also the manager of uh, design methods under all those combinations. Uh, I worked at headquarters in Pittsburgh for the power P&D uh, uh, division for five years and then we were all transferred back to Muncie and I retired from uh, Westinghouse in about 1995. And what was your position after that? After uh, I retired from Westinghouse, a friend of mine owned Overland Models, which is an importer of uh, high-priced brass train models and mining equipment models. And uh, I worked for him in the engineering and technical uh, part, uh, developing product, uh, drawings and uh, measurements of models and so forth. Uh, in 1995, we decided to open up a plant in uh, Shanghai, China. So I was with him and helping to open up that plant and set up the factory over there. We operated about 10 years in Shanghai, China off and on, which I uh, traveled back and forth probably once or twice a year. Uh, spent sometimes two to three weeks and as much as six weeks there. Uh, we did sell the plant in 2005 and uh, it was not a profit-making uh, endeavor with some of the rules and restrictions that American companies had to uh, follow in China. So uh, I've done some uh, consulting work with Overland Models since then also. Now I'm retired. And now you're finally retired. Finally. That's it. <laughs> okay, um, let's start with just a, a few questions about Westinghouse and um, what happened, uh, and if any dates that you might remember, but the changes uh, that when we moved here in 1970, it was a thriving, a huge establishment with a, a very extensive workforce. What happened in that case? Okay. Uh, I began in uh, 1961 when the plant was built. Uh, the plant was a uh, $56 million plant set on 360 acres of ground. Um, I think they made some additions to the plant shortly after it was built, and I think the total price was around, price was around $62 million, if, if I remember right. The plant uh, has about a million square feet in it. Uh, the main aisle, which is the central aisle, if you look at it from the uh, west side, is about 660 feet long, 110 foot high, and 120 foot wide. It has two 310 cranes, which are still there. All the aisles that feed that are called feeder aisles off of the sides, and they fed the product into the main aisle, which was assembled and then went down the uh, to the east, and it was put on the car and shipped from there. Uh, the company itself did very well until probably into the 70s, 80s, uh, many other foreign companies came into uh, uh, power as far as power transformers. We had Mitsubishi in Japan, we had Siemens, we had ASEA in Sweden, we had Brown Bovary in Switzerland, we had English Electric, we had various others. Uh, many of the utilities began buying from these foreign companies because they could get a better price. Delivery wasn't always as good, but they said they could get a better price for them. So that started eating into our business a bit. Uh, in the early 80s, uh, Westinghouse Power uh, Transformer Division, it was actually Power T&D, which is transformer and, transformer and Distribution, 
decided to uh, move their central offices from Muncie to Green Tree, Pennsylvania, which is in Pittsburgh. Uh, they thought they could manage the whole ball of wax there a little better. And at the same time, we started merging the Sharon, Pennsylvania Westinghouse plant that made core form transformers. Muncie plant made shell form transformers. There's a distinct difference between the two. Uh, it seemed there was always a battle from day one between shell and core form to which was the best, but we did buy out uh, and take over uh, the core form business. And then in about 83, 84, I believe it was, uh, General Electric was also struggling with the uh, uh, utilities because of the foreign uh, businesses. And uh, consequently, uh, it was either going to be GE or Westinghouse. And it ended up that uh, Westinghouse bought out the core form, large power core form from General Electric in Pittsville, Massachusetts. I happened to be living in Pittsburgh at the time and was in on uh, part of the acquisition of that as far as uh, in the engineering and the drafting and the computer areas. So uh, I, was, I was in on that. We did take over that technology and brought it to Muncie. We incorporated uh, the core form technology along with the shell form technology uh, in the Muncie plan and consequently we built both shell form and core form transformers in Muncie. At about that time, uh, ABB, which is, uh, was a combination of ASEA from Sweden, Ludvika, Sweden, and Brown Bovary from Zurich, Switzerland, merged and they were becoming a, a dominant player in the uh, power transformer and generation and electrical apparatus uh, business. So they came over to the United States and uh, investigated some mergers with I think probably GE and some other companies as well as Westinghouse and, and a deal was struck between Westinghouse and ABB. Uh, it came in online as a, a joint venture to begin with and we merged uh, AB, let me back up a little bit, ABB was also a large power core form like our Sharon, Pennsylvania plant was and the GE plant. So they merged their technology with what we had purchased from GE and we decided to go with the ABB type technology which was slightly different from the uh, domestic product. So we merged the large power core with the shell form and continued to operate in, in Muncie. As Time went by, of course, uh, no merger is easy and it was very difficult. And we worked uh, hand in hand with uh, people in Ludvika, Sweden and uh, in Varenne in Canada and various other plants that they had taken over also. Uh, and uh, consequently, uh, I don't think that the core form ever really did very well. It, it, was a different technology than what the people at Muncie were used to manufacturing, but it did eventually catch a hold and we did produce transformers. Then in the late uh, 80s or early 90s, I should say, the business sort of dwindled here in this country and uh, it appeared to many of the people at uh, ABB Westinghouse that essentially what had happened was ABB had come in and essentially purchased the market. And uh, it's probably well known now that Westinghouse is no longer in existence. It is all ABB, what is left. Uh, we still have a plant in Alamo, Tennessee that makes bushings for transformers. Uh, the plant in St. Louis, Missouri assembles the transformers, what there are, even though it's a very small plant. Uh, Jefferson City, Missouri still has a plant that makes, uh, I believe, pad mount type, tra or uh, pad mount or pull type transformers as well as Athens, Georgia and South Boston, Virginia. So those plants are still in existence but almost everything else ABB wise is now either offshore or most of the business is in uh, Canada at Varenne. So that's sort of a, a, a rough history and then in about 93, late 93, 94, 95 Westinghouse began uh, offering some buyouts and some early retirements for folks and that's when I took advantage of, of the retirement at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So was there anything particularly about Muncie that um, saw them closing the plant or was this a bigger issue that was global and institutional yeah. within ABB? I believe it was a bigger uh, thing than what just Muncie was. Muncie had the largest, most modern power transformer plant around 
It was the latest plant built. It was newer than the General Electric plant in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Uh, the plant that ABB was uh, building their transformers out of in uh, Varin, Canada. Varin is just east and slightly across the river from Montreal in Canada. It's a smaller plant. The lifting capacity is not as great. They do not even have their own test facility. They have to use, um, I believe, Quebec Hydro's test facility, which is about a mile down the track. So they have to put transformers on a train, take them outside, take them a mile down the track and test them. Where Muncie has its own test facility right in the plant. So I don't think there was anything unique about Muncie. I think ABB just wanted to buy the market, get it out of here, and operate in Europe. And I think that's what they did. So it was, if it isn't too much of a pun, a sheer power play on their part. I think so. Yeah. So there wasn't much that Muncie could have done to keep that from happening. I'm not certain there was. Mm -hmm. I don't feel there was anything Muncie could have done. Because if you look around, uh, uh, if you look at Baltimore, we had the nuclear division there and the uh, uh, some of the defense operations there. That's all gone. That's no longer in existence. We had some of the... Uh, uh, one of the other big things, uh, and I'm, try I'm struggling trying to find the name of it, it's the air conditioning units for semi-trailers. Uh, Thermo King was the division of Westinghouse, and that was a big money maker. That was up in Minnesota, South Dakota, someplace up there. That is also gone now. Westinghouse doesn't even have that. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure Muncie could have done anything on the Westinghouse plant to uh, have retained it here. Mm-hmm. Um. Well, what has happened to the, uh, I mean, we, we've had news and a lot of other information about efforts to do something with the plant because it is a huge facility. Um, have you been involved in any of those kind of things? or? The only thing I've been involved with are some recommendations that I've made on my own uh, with no concerted or organized effort by anybody else. Um, I was the president of the National Railway Historical Society in, uh, at uh, Taylor University for a couple, three years. And we had our National Board of Directors meeting in Indianapolis. Uh, I'm not sure what the year was. I believe it was in uh, 06, in uh, about May of that year. And we toured the Amtrak uh, maintenance facilities, which maintains Amtrak's car fleet and locomotive fleet for Amtrak in the United States. At that time, Beach Grove, which is a suburban area of Indianapolis, was wanting to utilize that 118, I think, plus acres that um, uh, Beach Grove sat on because it was an old facility. And uh, having toured that plant, I quizzed a couple of people and there was some indication that they were thinking about moving to a different location. And I happened to mention the Westinghouse plant, which they were not aware of. Uh, when I got back home, this I, was to Amtrak. Excuse me. This was to Amtrak to personnel? an Amtrak individual mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. and uh, he said they did. He didn't really know for sure exactly what their plans were, and nothing had been firmed up. But there might be an interest in doing something like that. But he wasn't certain. So once I returned to Muncie, I did happen to contact uh, Dan Allen, who was the head of the Chamber of Commerce. I happened to stumble onto him in a in a local business. And mentioned this to him, and he said to give him a, a, a slight write-up and uh, maybe a contact's name, which I did, uh, about maybe moving the uh, Amtrak facility here to Muncie. I recommended this because I thought the plant area-wise, it had its own uh, uh, switchyard in it. It had its own power facilities, which were more than ample for a car repair. It had its own tank farm for oils and fuels and so forth. It had rail lines in every part of the building. Uh, some of them had been filled in, but those could have been chipped out. Uh, there was a turntable even down on the uh, test floor, which could things could have been turned on. There were 300-ton uh, lifting capacity, and actually you couple them together. You can lift 600-ton in the main aisle, and I believe a locomotive is, I think you can lift a locomotive with 175 to 200 tons, so more than ample facilities there to do that with and more room. The plant was a spatial plant made for power transformers, and it is a spatial plant that just not everybody's going to be able to move into and, and make work. I don't think you could bring a bunch of stamp collectors or diamond merchants into a building like that and make it go. It's, it's a big, mm -hmm. heavy industry. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it is certainly, uh, I've never been in it, but I've driven past it many times and it's just it's huge. huge. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yep. Um, so your idea was that it might make a suitable place for locomotive and uh, and rail car repair right. and a repair shop in right. short. The only thing that I could see that the plant lacked from a car repair facility, which would probably have to be added to any plant they got, was what's called a transfer table. That's where a train comes in, goes onto a section of track, like a table, and it moves from one place to another so it can go down different tracks to be worked on. Other than that, I, I saw nothing that this plant couldn't offer. Mm -hmm. um, what was the response of the Chamber of Commerce at that point? I got no reply at all. None? None. So then what? I checked a couple of times after that and was told that they would be working on it when some members of the chamber returned from the Orient and still no reply from them after two or three months. Later on, one of the members of the chamber was speaking at the Exchange Club and I asked him about this letter, if he had knew anything about it, he said he had known nothing about it at all. So I sent him another copy with another cover letter with it uh, still no reply. So to this day, I've heard nothing of it. So not even a yay, nay. Now there may be nothing to it. Maybe Amtrak's not going to do anything. Maybe, maybe they've decided to go someplace else. Maybe they're going to do away with Amtrak. I don't know. But at least I think it was something we should have looked at. And if indeed we did look at it, I think uh, there should have been at least a response of saying, hey, this is viable or no, it isn't, mm -hmm. which I did not receive. So as far as far as your knowledge is concerned, uh, there was no contact between. There was either no contact, or if there was, it was negative, and I have heard nothing. And you've heard nothing about it. No. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any ideas about what else could be done with that facility? I know there have been there was talk of of having a prison there. Um, the neighbors objected and. And um, that didn't never <clears throat> got off the ground, but I guess my own personal opinion, I would not object to a prison being there. Uh, and like you say, it's not in my backyard, but uh, uh, it's still in the in our area and in, in the county. But I don't think, from a the standpoint of it being a prison, there would really bother me. I do not think that building is suited for a prison. The reason I don't think that. That's basically a big structural steel building with very high ceilings, very difficult to heat, very difficult to get power to it. And the other thing is, I think you would have to build a building within a building in order to make a prison work there. And that may cost more than what it's worth doing. And then you've got all the rail facilities, the tank farm and all the electrical facilities coming in there for naught. I don't see anything that could probably be used from those. When you've got power in there of 38,069 kV, what do you do with that in a prison? <laughs> a little bit too much to run an electric chair off of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what do you, so do you see any future for that other than eventually I, I, crumbling? I see, I see some future for that building. I think if we could get the right heavy industry in there or promote it to people who would uh, utilize it in the heavy industry. I think it is, right now, I, I believe it's being utilized maybe by Red Gold or Coca-Cola or somebody to store empty cans in. So it doesn't require much heat to do that, but you do have to maintain heat and some power in that building. There is somebody out there doing that. Uh, it is a large facility that you have to uh, keep uh, watch over and guard and make sure there's no vandalizing and so forth. And there's things that people could get hurt there on. So I, I see it being used in some heavy type industry. Uh, the manufacture maybe of large uh, earth moving type equipment, military equipment, uh, just very large uh, pieces of equipment or machinery that takes uh, heavy lifting, moving, turning. Uh, the floors in that building are tremendously thick. They carry a tremendous load. There's places there as concrete is six foot thick in that building. So it could hold just about whatever you want to set in there. I don't see, 
you know, to see a very light industry going in there, I guess it could happen, but I think it would be a real waste of a facility. And warehousing, I guess you can continue to use it at that. You can store a lot of things in there, but I don't think that employs very many people. Uh, no. Warehousing employs a skeleton crew of people, mm -hmm. and I don't think that's a major benefit to this community. Mm -hmm. Well, it could. Um, the employment generally is low on that, but it also um, could be generating some tax revenues it and could. you know those kind of things as sure. well. I would I would imagine certainly could. Mm -hmm. Where now the, the way I see it. Uh, you know, you have the last two tenants, I believe, in that building have probably used them as tax write-offs for that structure and maybe made a few bucks on it, if, if any, on the uh, warehousing. But, uh, you know, when you have a warehousing facility and you employ 8, 10, 15 people, you know, versus 2,000 or 3,000, that doesn't buy you much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they're paying tax on it, on that land and, and the facility, but, but I think it could better be suited for a heavy industry. Mm -hmm. Have you had any other involvement with any of the various economic development efforts over the past no. 15 or 20 years? Since None you were to speak here? of, huh? other than the fact that I am on the Middletown studies and that's about the extent of it. Mm -hmm. um, would you, from your perspective, uh, what do you think would be the three most important things that Muncie should address uh, in its efforts to uh, foster economic development? Well, l let me start out by giving you a pet peeve of mine, and maybe then that'll lead into something else. <clears throat> Muncie, a number of years ago, and I don't remember the number, maybe two years, three years ago, we got Sally May in the community. And I'm not against Sally May. I think that's, that's fine, and we've got employment from Sally May. But then you read in the paper the next year where Gas City got a warehouse, and Marion got this, and Newcastle did something else. And we came up with an article in the Muncie paper that said, Sally May is ahead of schedule. And then the next few months, another community, Winchester and Union City, got something, and they expanded a little bit. Muncie came up and said, Sally May is still ahead of schedule and maybe going to add more than what they had anticipated. And then another community or two gets something else and Muncie comes back and says, Mun Muncie's got Sally May and they're really ahead of schedule and we're really moving on that. And it seems funny to me that we keep falling back on the one positive aspect that we've got in the last five years and I don't hear of anything else. Now whether this is the news media or reality, I don't know. But I think the people of Muncie are smarter than that and they really know what's going on in this community. And I don't think we're really working after very much, or at least maybe the past union problems and the employment problems in this community have left such a bad taste in people's mouth that they can't get anything else. But this is sort of a off the cuff, real thing that rubs me the wrong way in this community. Mm -hmm. uh, are, there th are there things about Muncie that uh, make it less desirable in some other places for potential employers? Well, as I, as I mentioned, I think some of the past um, labor relation uh, uh, problems that Muncie's had has probably left a bad taste in many people's mouths. But I think there are a lot of good things in the community. I think the community has a, has a university, has a good hospital facility. I, I think the Cardinal Greenway is a great asset. I, I really think the AMA is a great asset. It, asset if they would uh, publicize a little more to the local community and make it a little more accessible. Uh, I think it's, a, it's really a good crossroads of America. I think one of the other bad things that Muncie uh, has lost out on back in the years past was the proximity of the interstate. I think we're a little bit far off of that. However, with Indianapolis migrating toward the east, this may help us a bit. We may even uh, have become a um, more of a bedroom community, maybe, but uh, I see that as a problem as well as the uh, past union problems. And probably some of the old political crony system that we have in place in this community is not helping us. I don't see a lot of cooperation. Uh, I think there could be a lot more better 
or a better relationship between Ball State and Muncie itself. Having been born in the community, uh, I see it has improved over the years, but I think it still has a ways to go, the relation between Ball State and community. Uh, I have been, I pay attention to a few things. I know there was several things in uh, the county planning that it was done and associated with Ball State, uh, and there were several recommendations made, and I, I don't think anything was done by the community to follow up on that. And I think the bypass was one of the big things. When the bypass issue came up a couple, three years ago, you know, we didn't follow any plan that was thrown out five, ten years ago, and consequently, we're almost at a standstill on a good bypass in Muncie now. Because communities just developed in haphazard around. There was no plan followed. So I see that as a... See that as a detriment. liability? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Are you familiar with uh, any of the decisions, other decisions to close local facilities? I mean, those have happened quite a bit. I don't, I don't know the reasons on, on the closings. Um, I, I have known people that worked at Chevrolet. I have known people that worked at uh, uh, Borg Warner and also the Ball Corporation and Delco. My dad was a tool and die maker at Delco and. Uh, the Muncie Delco plant, believe it or not, was the biggest, largest facility that Delco Battery had, and they decided mm -hmm. to move it out. I don't know what the reason was, whether it was labor, uh, community relations, I really don't know what the reasoning was there, but the Muncie Battery plant had the largest capacity of any of the battery plants, and it was as modern as any of them. Mm -hmm. But I think there was a, a stigma that the, the community wasn't growing very much, too, and there wasn't much to attract people. So that may have been something to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, have, are you familiar with any of the various uh, horizon vision statements that have come out of the Chamber of Commerce and the economic development? Only like, a little, not, not mm -hmm. to any extent, no. I don't know that I'm that aware of it. No. Okay. Um, do you think that's something that ought to be perhaps a little more visible or? I sure do. I think people should be more aware of those things. I mean, they do produce stories in the newspaper and, right. uh, and there have been brochures and all of those. Some of those, and I have picked up on some of them, yes, but I think maybe a pamphlet uh, actually or uh, some type of a brochure promoting that type of thing saying, hey, here are some of the things we're working on. Here's some of the things that, here's some positives in our community. Here's some negatives that we need help on. And I think the public needs to know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, you know, once it gets in the newspaper, is it, is it verbatim or is it distorted? I, I don't know. So we need to, uh, if we had some publication that would go around to at least interested individuals. I don't know how you find those interested individuals, but uh, whether it's a public mm -hmm. mailing or what it is, but... Uh, I think it would be beneficial for people to know this. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the uh, political situation and the governmental situation which follows on that. Do you have any further things to say about that? or No. What do, do you think that's a, you know, how is that helping or hindering? I think it's hindering the community, really. Um, you know, I see our mayor, irregardless of what a person's politics are, you know, uh, you know, it's river over the dam now, and you have a mayor in there, and I, and I think you need to cooperate, and you need to work together to better the community, and I don't see that being done. I see roadblocks being thrown both ways, and it's, uh, well, this was done in the past, and this wasn't right, so we're going to get even. Well, hey, let's forget about it. Let's just do what's right now, and let's move on with it, and let's better the community. I don't see a lot of that happening. So, it's the other day, and, and I think our news, I, I think our news could be a little different in our reporting. I, I saw the other day there was two or three articles on the, from the black community about there was no possibilities for black professional students getting out of school and no place to go and they're leaving the community. Well, I don't think that's a unique black problem. I think it is maybe more of a problem for the black population. I think it's a problem in general for our community. 
I don't see very many people getting out of school here that's staying in this community and working. There's nothing to work. What do you do? Do you want to go to school all your life and work at Sally May or flip hamburgers? I don't think so. So I think we need to be a little more far-reaching on a lot of our reporting. But I see so much dissension in our politics in this community. And if you go back to the old Middletown studies and all that, I think that bears that out. You know, there's not a lot of, maybe there hasn't been a lot of change, I don't know. Mm -hmm. what, what experience do you have with other communities? Where, where else have you lived, if I might ask? Basically, I've lived in the Pittsburgh area, Pennsylvania, and I lived north of Pittsburgh and Wexford, but I worked downtown Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that I see. Uh, where I work there, of course, it's a growing, growing, Pittsburgh was growing at that point in time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not certain where it is now. I think it has slowed down a bit, but I think there's still growth there, especially to the north. And I lived north up in the Wexford area, and it was housing and everything else was, was growing tremendously. I also have a home in Kosciuszko County on a lake up there. And I see all the difference in the world in Kosciuszko County and Delaware County. I see people working together, I see business thriving, I see homes being built, I see new businesses going in, I see new industry going in and new business going in. Of course that's a uh, uh, prosthetic uh, medical type industry in that area which is probably not affected very much by inflation or anything else. People need new needs, they need them. So I see a, a real growth there and it's, a, it's just a real positive and I see a, a more positive attitude in the people up there than I do here. Is there anything you would attribute that to? or? I think it's due to the economy and the growth in that area. I see new businesses, new possibilities, new jobs being created for these folks up there. And I, th I think it's just a good situation. Mm -hmm. But something has to make it a good situation as opposed to... And I think the one thing that has really helped up there, you have three of the bio... Uh, technology companies. You have the Zimmer, you have the Biomet, and you have Depew. And they all compete with one another, and I think each one of them probably employs between two and 3,000. And Bristol Myers is uh, probably, I think, bought out Zimmer, and now I think recently there's a French company or a European company come in with them, but they're not moving it out of the country. They're keeping it there, and the people know that. And the community's growing. And it's just a positive attitude on those folks up there. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's go back to that question of, of uh, what does Muncie need to do, in your opinion? Do you think, first off, that Muncie is a hard sell or an easy sell to someone coming here to locate? I think it's a hard sell. I think it's tough. I think you come in here and you look at our infrastructure, and I think it's weak. I think if you look at the condition of our roads and our houses and our some of the blight that's evident, very evident, in our community as you drive up and down some of the streets, uh, I think it's uh, you look around and you see empty factories, you see empty businesses, you go downtown and there's just not a lot down there. Uh, we have maybe one good restaurant or two and. Uh, couple, three jewelry stores and that and some banks. That's about it. And uh, I think uh, you can walk out and you can show them the Cardinal Greenway and show them the university and the hospital and those are all positives. And I would put a lot of weight on those. You can go around and you can see a lot of nice housing developments. But if you really want to concentrate on total housing, there's an awful lot of lower income blighted areas also in the community. I think the new downtown efforts on the Millennium Place and all that I think have been very positive. If they keep these up and maintain them and if we have enough money uh, governmentally to do all this, I think that'll continue to be a positive for us. But I, I think Muncie is a, is a tough sell. I, you know, I'm not I'm not blaming the total chamber or the government or the politics in this community totally, but I think it has to start there. And it has to start with them and the people. And, uh, you know, if you go around to groups of people that you run around with in your age group and your peer groups, 
you know, that's, that's the basic conversation is a condition not only of Muncie, but I think of our, our United States in total. And I think, uh, I think we're just a little worse off in this community than several other communities in, this, uh, in the country, although there are several other in worse shape than we are. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, well, is there anything else you'd like to say to add to what your remarks or? I don't know of anything, Paul. It's just, uh, I guess it's frustrating having been born and raised here and uh, to see it a pittance of what it used to be back in the 60s and 70s when we had a, a booming industry and an economy and uh, Things seem to be rolling pretty smoothly, even though there were problems then. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think there were a lot less. Mm -hmm. But it's it's that we we've come a long way in the community. There's been a lot of things done, which are are great. That there's a lot of things that hadn't been done too. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Well, one of our experiences was that coming here, we we find the cultural life pretty fulfilling. Mm -hmm. Um, the arts, the entertainment, sure. and those things are in considerable part because of the university. Mm -hmm. um, they're easily accessed. They're not too expensive. Right. There are a lot of things you can do besides stay home and watch TV. Oh, yeah. But, you know, I've worked, my wife and I both, we worked with a, <clears throat> with a group called Kids Hope. I don't know whether you've ever heard of a lot of churches work with Kids Hope, and we mentor some children. And I mentor a little boy at a Mitchell School, and he's a second grader, third grader. He'll be a third grader. And uh, you see so many of these kids and these, these families, they have no inkling of the cultural life that's available. Not even the, the simplest of the cultural things that's in this community. They have no inkling of it. And why that is, I don't know. I think it's hand to mouth and, and and that's the extent of it but you know you look at this and it's a sad situation and you go to the YMCA and you see some of these kids and uh, it's just not not a good situation I don't see those folks in any way being assimilated into the community and being able to take advantage of some of these cultural things mm -hmm. the little boy that I I mentor, I asked him, I said, have you ever been out to the AMA and, and seen airplanes? Do you like airplanes? Oh, yeah. Have you ever, do you know anything about models? No, I don't know. And so I took a kite out one day and I said, well, let's, I'm going to bring a kite out next week. And there's three or four of the boys, there's other people that mentor too, and we're all going to have a kite fly. Three or four of them had no inkling what a kite was. Mm -hmm. And I have trouble <laughs> fathoming a kid in the third grade not really knowing what a kite is. You know, and that's a pretty basic thing that uh, this little boy had no, no knowledge of it. Probably knows something about about uh, computer yes. games and something about exercising computer the games thumbs. and also uh, about programs on TV that he would have had no business even watching. Mm -hmm. I see that, and no home life. There's no structure, and I don't think that's unique to Muncie. Mm -hmm. I th I see that happening. Mm -hmm. There's just no family. Mm -hmm. So those were just a few things that I picked up on. Okay. And we, we help with Habitat, too, and it, it's the same situation with the folks there. These folks, I don't think they have any inkling of some of the culture that it is available to them in the community. Mm -hmm. And even if they did know, <laughs> I'm not sure they could or would take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. Just not their upbringing. I see a... I see a generation that deteriorated and it was a, not much of a family and then the next generation was even less of a family life and then even less. And maybe we're down the third generation and there's just not a lot a lot there to pass down. There's no father that can teach a boy or a girl to fish or to swim or to, to whatever. Mm -hmm. No extracurricular. Now here's the TV. Go watch it. Keep out my hair. Mm-hmm.
Okay. Well, I don't have any more questions. I want to thank you for your time. Okay. I want to, for your sure. willingness to share this, and uh, I will certainly look at these things that you have here. Well, I hope that's been of some help. I, to you. Yes. Thank you very much. Sure.